evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. New Yorkers are digging out after a massive storm battered the Northeast with as much as two feet of snow in some areas. The first major winter storm of 2021 shut down much of the Big Apple with Central Park reporting more than 15 inches and New York's governor warning people to stay off the roads. The high winds and mounting totals put a stop to all scheduled COVID vaccinations. Public schools went all remote as Catholic elementary school kids enjoyed a traditional snow day. Subway service was suspended, then restored early Tuesday morning. Vaccination sites are expected to reopen on Wednesday, as are most schools. There's some good news for New York's estimated 30,000 dreamers. President Biden is moving ahead with a series of executive actions on immigration that could provide a pathway to citizenship. Jessica Easthope has the story. Ilsa Mendez came to Laredo, Texas with her parents at the age of two. She's now 33. Everyone in her family, including her four children, are now U.S. citizens, except her. Mendez is one of the hundreds of thousands of people known as dreamers. President Biden is proposing a pathway to citizenship for these immigrants who have been able to live in the U.S. because of the program known as DACA. We've lived four years of Trump stringing us along with that fear and anxiety. So I, I'm hopeful that something will, uh, something positive will come out of these uh, different legislations or these executive actions that Biden has brought. On other issues, Biden will face legal challenges. The president issued a 100-day pause on deportations, but a federal judge has temporarily blocked that move. And there are still about 28,000 migrants sitting in Mexican border towns, waiting to seek asylum through the controversial Remain in Mexico policy. Advocates have pushed for these migrants to be allowed into the country while their cases are handled in immigration courts. I will accomplish what I said I would do, a much more humane policy based on family unification. Former acting director of Immigration and Customs Enforcement Ronald Vitello warns that Biden's immigration policies could create another surge of migrants at the southern border. My warning would be learn from the history that we already have. When you roll back those elements of what's in place now, then you're going to you're going to encourage people. The Biden administration is also encouraging all people, regardless of immigration status, to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It says federal immigration agencies will not be conducting enforcement operations at or near vaccine distribution sites or clinics. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. U.S. bishops are applauding Biden's efforts to strengthen DACA and are prepared to work with the president and Congress on immigrants' rights, saying in a statement, quote, For years, DACA youth have been enriching our country and have been leaders in our parishes and communities. They are calling the issue an urgent matter of human life and dignity. The fallout continues over New York's attorney general report that the state severely undercounted the number of nursing home deaths from the coronavirus. Now, several of Governor Cuomo's health officials have reportedly either resigned, retired, or have been reassigned. Currents News' Emily Druby has more. New Yorkers demanding answers and action after the state's attorney general shows nursing home deaths were much higher than originally detailed by the state. Someone has to be held responsible, and we've got to get to the bottom of this. New York City Councilman Eric Ulrich has been very vocal in sounding the alarm from the beginning. After losing several friends in nursing homes and hearing from his constituents, he realized the numbers weren't adding up. Now his suspicions have seemingly been confirmed. Numerous mistakes made and bad policy decisions that were made that directly resulted in the deaths of thousands of New Yorkers who didn't have to die. And then the governor tried to cover that up. Here's what happened. Back in the summer, there was talk that the number of nursing home deaths attributed to COVID-19 could be much higher than the state was reporting. That's because nursing home residents who died in hospitals were not being counted. Governor Cuomo dodged these critics for months, but last week, State Attorney General Letitia James, who is a Democrat, released a scathing report after a long investigation that began with multiple complaints of COVID-related neglect. That forced health department officials to release their closely held data, contributing thousands of new deaths to nursing home totals, about 45 percent higher than the original number, many angry over a lack of transparency. 
The report also bringing up a highly criticized early pandemic decision by Cuomo, forcing nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients. Now, the governor denied any undercount, taking issues with the AG's findings, his response fueling the fire. Whether a person died in a hospital or died in a nursing home, it's the people died. His health commissioner, Howard Zucker, reminding people the number of deaths hasn't changed. It's where they happened. Reporting the number of deaths is always the hardest number to report out there, and we wanted to be sure uh, that the, those numbers were accurate. Now attention has been turned towards next steps. The fact that the governor engaged in this cover-up, uh, people should be outraged. There needs to be uh, a full-fledged investigation. And uh, somebody has to be held responsible for this. The White House said they'll decide if a Department of Justice investigation on the matter will take place. There have been calls for Cuomo's health commissioner to resign while Attorney General James continues to investigate at least 20 nursing homes of particular concern. Emily Druby, Currents News. Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis also called for an investigation months ago. Now on Facebook, she's calling for Cuomo to demand his health commissioner resign. I spoke with her earlier and asked if she wants Zucker to step down. What about the governor? I think, you know, we certainly need more information of what the governor knew. Uh, the governor is the one that indeed did sign that executive order, which many of us disagree with and has led to thousands of deaths. And so um, certainly I think that the governor needs to take accountability. He needs to answer the questions that uh, the public has. And we need to make sure that we are uh, make, holding this governor accountable. Um, so I think, I think for me and most New Yorkers, there are two main questions that people have. You know, one is uh, what information did the governor base his decision to mandate nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients, even after they said they did not have the ability to care for them? And why did that executive order even continue after we had alternatives like the U.S. Navy Comfort Ship, which President Trump sent to New York Harbor. Uh, the Javits Center was set up as an emergency hospital. Also locally, Staten Island, uh, the, the South Beach Psychiatric Center was set up as an emergency hospital. And they were not operating at capacity. So mm -hmm. they could have certainly taken those additional COVID positive patients. Yeah, you've been very vocal about your suspicions of the number of COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes all along. Um, you were one of the first to push for the investigation. And what made you call for that investigation in the beginning? Like so many of my constituents, um, I was very outraged by the number of deaths that we saw coming out of New York nursing homes, much larger percentage than you saw in other parts of the country. Uh, I was also very much upset with the governor instituting that executive order that mandated these nursing homes take COVID positive patients. In many cases, the local nursing homes that I spoke to on the ground, you know, they, they felt that they were not equipped to take those, those patients. Uh, they told the health department that, and yet they were forced to continue to take those patients. Secondly, there was a lack of testing that was available to identify and then isolate those uh, nursing home uh, patients or staff members uh, to make sure that they didn't infect others in the uh, nursing home community. So these are a number of things I think that should have been done differently. So the numbers were off by about 4,000 with this report coming out. The new data released from the Department of Health puts the total number of COVID-19 related deaths of nursing home residents at 12,743. That's compared to 8,700 originally reported. The health commissioner, as you were just talking about, he dismissed the report of undercounting, saying the Department of Health made clear that the numbers are reported based on the place of death. Your reaction to that? Yeah, well, you know, it, it does matter that these individuals were infected at the nursing homes because that is the whole argument we've been making this entire time that COVID positive patients should not have been put in the nursing homes with uh, the most vulnerable. You know, we knew from the beginning, and the one thing we knew from the beginning uh, was that the most vulnerable were our elderly, those with underlying conditions. They were the ones that would most likely die if they were infected with the coronavirus. And so knowing that, you know, it was a very misguided decision by the Cuomo administration to place 
uh, COVID positive patients in those nursing homes. It's like putting a fox in a hen house. You just don't do it. And now uh, the fact that he's trying to justify this by saying it doesn't matter whether they, they passed away at a nursing home or a hospital, it certainly does matter. What matters is where were they infected? And if they were at the nursing home and then transported to the hospital where they passed away, then that means that it is due to the executive order that the governor put in place on March 25th. And the governor is actually blaming the Trump administration. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, that, that's been their tactic all along. When anything goes wrong, to blame the Trump administration and try to deflect from their responsibilities. The reality is that on March uh, 17th, Governor Cuomo said, the buck stops on my desk. Uh, and so that means he needs to take accountability. He needs to take ownership of what occurred here. And I don't see him doing that right now. Again, that was Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis, who represents Brooklyn and Staten Island. Zucker still has his job for now. Others who have reportedly left their posts at the DOH include the executive deputy commissioner and the deputy health commissioner. Turning now to safety on campus, students at St. John's University will soon be returning to in-person learning thanks to the college's on-campus testing efforts. Perfect, you're all set, have a nice day. You too. thank Take you. Care. The school will turn to a hybrid model for the spring semester and is requiring students to get tested. To help get that initiative rolling, the college held a massive testing effort free of charge. The on-campus testing is done with help from the university's pharmaceutical graduate students who can have results within 60 to 90 minutes. It was a really easy procedure. I showed my ID, filled out one form, and now I've got peace of mind. So what happens in this room is that the graduate students are helping the community by doing COVID-19 testing for all the students um, in St. John's University. We're doing uh, the rapid testing, the Acula testing, and the lab is ready also for doing PCR testing. If they live on campus, we have a space, an isolation dorm, uh, where we house them, we bring them meals, and we are in contact with them every day to monitor symptoms. If they're off campus, of course, they follow the same instructions at home and we assist them as we can. We hope that we can keep our students safe and, and constant testing is critical for that. It's a huge change from what's normal. And uh, St. John's has had to, like every school, uh, learn how to adapt. St. John's is also an approved vaccine distribution site. The administration is waiting for the expansion and wider distribution of shots before they can begin those efforts. Now to big news today for the Knights of Columbus, Supreme Knight Carl Anderson has been honored with the 2021 Pro-Life Legacy Award, a prestigious honor given by the March for Life. It recognizes a lifetime of leadership in defense of the unborn. Anderson, who has headed the Knights since 2000, urged the pro-life movement to remain committed to justice, truth, democracy, and compassion. In the meantime, the leader of the nation's largest pro-life demonstration is happy with how the March for Life turned out this year. The rally was virtual due to the pandemic and security concerns at the Capitol. The president of the March for Life, Jeannie Mancini, spoke with Currents News about how the new format affected the fight for life. It seems like every year there's something that is different. Maybe there's a blizzard. Um, maybe we've got a government shutdown. Sometimes we have a White House presence at the March for Life. This year it was the COVID pandemic and uh, other events recently with some violence and different things like that. And we had to take some extra precautions. So we had kind of a back to the basics march. One of the ways that we got back to the basics this year was for all of the pro-life leaders to carry a rose. Um, the rose used to be carried prior to 9-11 to legislators, often pro-choice legislators, to remind them of the beauty of life. And so the rose is reflective of the beauty and the dignity of every human life. And so we just wanted to return to the basics and to carry that simple, you know, red rose this year, remembering the, the lives lost and um, praying with hope on the conversion of hearts of those pro-choice legislators. Over 300,000 people watched the march online. There's a lot more news headed your way. They waited years to round out their family. Then the pandemic delayed their hopes even more. But finally, a happy ending. One family's emotional adoption story is coming up next. And there's music again at one Brooklyn church after parishioners chip in to have their organ restored and they couldn't be happier.
One couple was just days away from adopting their daughter before the virus shut down the city. Now, nine months later, after patiently waiting, they are finally getting their own happy ending. Currents News' Jessica Easthope shares their story from Bedford-Stuyvesant. Cece, can you slam the gavel for me? <laughs> A sound the Gebhardt Schmidt family has been waiting to hear for years. High five. <laughs> Lindsay and Peter have Evelyn, their biological daughter, Cece, their adopted daughter, and a foster son. Did it have your name on it? In November, they yeah. finally okay. adopted their daughter, Cece. It was a happy ending, years in the making, but the pandemic proved to be their biggest hurdle. We spent um, a number of years trying to adopt her, you know, dedicated to her, particularly, you know, her education, interacting with her biological family. We were only three days away from adopting her and the pandemic happened. In 2019, 202 adoptions were finalized in Brooklyn. In 2020, that number dropped to 61. The rest were delayed. <laughs> Lindsay and Peter spent a grueling nine months wondering if the day would ever come. To us, she's always been our daughter. Now, legally she is and, and, and everything that comes with that. This is the photo of Cece falling asleep um, on my husband's chest. In the time it took to adopt Cece, Lindsay and Peter had some tough decisions to make, one of them being her name. But like many parts of their adoption journey, they let Faith lead the way. We called her Cece because her initials were CC when she was born. But when I was confirmed, I actually chose St. Cecilia. And so we did make the choice to go ahead and change her actual given name to Cecilia after St. Cecilia. Lindsay says those nine months tested her faith more than any other time in her life. The biggest thing that changed for me was the story about Jesus in the garden. It's definitely changed the way that I see the Bible and what I believe is someone making a huge sacrifice. Lindsay and Peter say they've learned when you're a foster parent, there's always another hurdle. Right now, that's adopting their foster son. The longer it takes, the harder it is to sort of answer those questions about why is his situation clearly so different than his, his sister's. Oh, you're the best. It will most likely <laughs> be years before Lindsay and Peter can adopt him. But now they know if they can make it through this, they can make it through anything together. In Bedford-Stuyvesant, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Another happy ending of sorts, this one for a different kind of family, a parish family. For the past year, the organ at Immaculate Heart of Mary Church has been out of service. But now, with the help of the community, the music is back. Currents News' Emily Jerby shares the details from Brooklyn. Hallelujah. Angie Holmgata has spent over 40 years sitting in these pews listening to this organ, a soothing sound she relies on during her almost daily trips to Immaculate Heart of Mary Church in Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn. But something has changed. The organ is a big difference for the community and the sound is totally different. This organ repaired for the first time since 1968. Feels great compared to playing the old one because it was very worn out and very out of tune. The restoration done by Paragallo Pipe Organ Company out of New Jersey was quite the undertaking, but essential. The organ plays a huge part in having good music, music that people feel, music that people experience, music that resonates with people's souls. So their pastor, Father Elias Gill, made it a priority. Two of the three organ bellows, which generates the wind, were not working. I said, how can you run on one bellow, on one leg? Now they have five. 1,400 pipes had to be reshaped, replaced, or cleaned up. Pieces removed one by one, taken up and down this ladder through this tiny opening. They also repaired the room it was in and added new electronics. It took a year and $350,000, a lot of that coming from collections and parishioners. So people are very generous, I can say. They always they support me. Since I'm here, I have never been seen that they put church down. They always supported the church. The community coming together and being there for their church, just like it's always there for them. This is our church. The people here are, are very caring about one another. Parishioners went almost a full year without the organ while it was being repaired, but now heavenly music will be heard at Immaculate Heart of Mary Church once again. In Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn, Emily Druby, Currents News.
Still to come on Currents News, he has been called God's architect. His masterpiece, the Basilica Sagrada Familia, is a world heritage site and one of the most visited attractions in Spain. Now he's on the road to sainthood. His story is next. Finally tonight, we are taking you to Europe, a place Americans haven't been in quite some time. You may fondly remember seeing the stunning basilica in Barcelona that has been under construction for nearly 140 years. But did you know the late architect who designed the Sagrada Familia could become a saint? He was a world-famous architect and a devout Catholic. Antoni Gaudí's faith clearly on display in the details of his most important work, the design of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Los dogmas. The principal dogmas of the Catholic doctrine are represented on the facades of the Sagrada Familia. Father Gabriel Cordoba is also a Spanish architect and wrote a book on the theology behind Gaudí's work. Like medieval cathedrals, authentic Bibles in stone, Gaudí conceived the Sagrada Familia as a large catechesis. He took the altarpieces that are usually found inside the church and moved them outside where everybody could see the truths of the Christian faith. Gaudí wanted to reflect the early Christian church, but with the progress and advances of the time. Pope Benedict XVI said that Gaudí's ability to bring out the altarpieces, his three facades, and his 18 towers made an ecclesiology. There, the church is proclaimed, and he reveals the glory of God through beauty. Father Cordoba says many elements have been gathered to show that the brilliant architect was a saint. He was a mystic and proclaimed God's glory through his works and his everyday life. Gaudí was a person with a great intellectual capacity. He was a cultured and very knowledgeable person, but he was also a deeply religious and spiritual person. The expression of faith through the liturgy was fundamental for him. He was a person of daily communion. Of course, he was also a defender of the faith during those turbulent times at the end of the 19th century. Gaudí not only sought God through architecture and his way of working, he saw God through the creation and all its people. Gabriel explains that Gaudí also inspired faith in others and continuously showed acts of solidarity to his workers, peers, and Barcelona citizens. I felt that it would be important to present a thesis that covers the entire building of the Basilica of the Sagrada Familia. I particularly wanted to convey that Gaudí, being a deeply religious person, was able to capture the beauty of what he lived and what he felt from God. All this inspiration came directly to him from God. Antoni Gaudí died in 1926 at the age of 74 while still working on the construction of the Basilica. The association that promotes the cause for his beatification has been working with the Vatican in order to declare him blessed. But before that can happen, they need the Pope to first declare him venerable and prove a miracle performed through his intercession. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.